Well, welcome back to Northwest Air Guns. I'm John, and here we are uh, with box number three of uh, the Air Gun Charlie collection. We're going to go through this, but I think we can do this a little quicker by uh, grouping them up into uh, like kind, because we have several uh, models here, several of the same model uh, in this particular box. So let's take a look at them. Well, we're going to start out today with the spring piston guns that were in uh, in this box. And we kind of have the whole gamut from, I, I'm guessing this is a pre-war, pre-World War II rifle, to this one, which I think is a 1970s, 1980s um, gun. And uh, so let's get the easy ones out of the way. This is a marksman. Well, marksman kind of doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but they used to be an independent company. And this is a biathlon trainer, a Model 1790. If you look at this side, it says it's uh, endorsed on this sticker here by the U.S. shooting team. And this is uh, sort of a replica of a target rifle uh, that you'd use if you were, um, like they ski and then they shoot and uh, stuff like that. Um, or maybe they bicycle and shoot. I'm not sure. I'm not really that familiar with the uh, shooting sports in the Olympics. It's kind of a cool gun. Um, it's got the uh, original diopter style peep sight on it for target shooting. A brake barrel. Uh, probably very little in the way of power, but um, you know, this is a trainer for accuracy, not power. So, kind of a cool little gun. Does have a safety on it here. And that one is out of the way. So this is uh, the other one that's uh, pretty easy to, to go through. It's, you know, the Daisy uh, Model uh, 102 BB gun. Doesn't seem to have much power. This is one of those where you load it here in the front and then every time I think you have to kind of shake it to get the BB in place as you cock it and shoot it so there's that one and then we get into these that are a little bit more interesting um, these two are made by um, made for Daisy in Scotland and this is a model 220 and the story, as I understand it, behind these is that they're made in Scotland. Um, and this one here says, uh, yeah, 22 caliber made for Daisy in Scotland, a Model 250. And as I understand it, um, after World War II, the, uh, the victors, uh, England and the United States, basically went into Germany and, and took stuff. And part of what they took was the air gun making equipment uh, from Diana and sold it at an auction, I guess, and the Milbro brothers, or Mil Milbro uh, bought it and started making um, these air guns that are essentially the uh, pre-war Diana air guns. And uh, these two are in pretty good shape. Um, this one is lacking a rear sight here, but otherwise looks pretty good. And so kind of an interesting little historical uh, gun. This says uh, Daisy 250. So, you know, it is a Daisy uh, because it was imported for Daisy, but it's actually a Diana pre-war rifle that was made in Scotland by Milbro. And this is similar. A Daisy 220, uh, it's in 177, and again, this uh, was imported for Daisy, um, and is kind of an example, of, again, of a pre-war uh, Diana air gun. Kind of cool. Okay, this last one, I'm going to zoom in here in a minute, but I don't know what it is. Um, it kind of looks like a, a another early pre-war Diana. Um, it's missing the trigger guard here. You can see that. 
um, and I don't know if any of it works. I'm going to zoom in in just a minute here. We'll take a look at it. But um, Charlie says it's a Hiller or a Diana Model 27 or an Eagle. So I don't know what it is. Um, and let's take a closer look at some of the markings on this and some of the features. Okay, I mentioned the uh, I mentioned that the trigger guard is missing here. So uh, I might have to remake something for that. Um, there's no markings on the barrel at all. And you can see that the barrel has uh, some light rust, surface rust on it. It doesn't feel like it's pitting. And the receiver as well has some surface rust on it. There's interesting markings here. Uh, if you can catch that in the camera, they look Asian to me. I don't know what those are, uh, which suggests to me maybe this is a, a, a Japanese gun, maybe a pre-war Japanese gun. And then here, let's see if get that. It's really, it's worn and it's really hard to read. Uh, let me see if I can't get something to highlight that. Okay, so here's the receiver, and there's some sort of an emblem on it, probably an eagle, and it actually says, you know, E-A-G, kind of an L. We're missing that last letter. No, there it is, eagle. And under that, it says uh, air rifle, you know, wouldn't it be the only thing that we can actually read and we already know what it is, an air rifle. And then under that is a B-O-R and then it gets obscure. I have no idea where this is from. Uh, it looks like at the very top there, come on, there it is, uh, above the eagle emblem. It says T-R-A and D-E, so it must have said trademark at some point. So that's what we've got. Um, if you have any idea what this rifle is, uh, if you could add us a, a note, that would be great. Well, here we have uh, five bulk fill uh, Crossman rifles. These are all in 22. These are all model uh, 114. And... Um, these must be pretty rare because I only had five of them in this collection. And so uh, the, they're all almost identical. The uh, shoots good, he says, uh, $450. Well, that would be great if I could get $450 for this. These are all bulk fill where you fill off of the bottle on the end. And we'll take a look at that in a second. Fill up this tube, and it's a pretty good sized tube. Uh, so it can hold quite a bit of CO2. And then they're single shot. Um, safety through the stock here. This one has a peep sight, which is a little bit odd. They usually come with um, uh, just a regular, regular sight like this one. Um, and all of the, well, set this one aside for a second. That's the one we're going to take a look at. But all of these have serial numbers on them and this one doesn't and I'm not sure if that means that this is an earlier rifle or uh, or a later rifle. Shoots good, $450. Um, needs a rear sight. Yes it does. Um, Three seventy-five. Well, this is missing the rear sight, I guess, but it's uh, it has a brass barrel um, instead of the uh, steel barrel. This one Charlie had at three fifty. It needs a rear sight as well. I don't know why two of them would ha have uh, rear sights missing, but they do. Um, and this one. 375, 
it needs a screw sight. Yeah, you need the elevation sight there, screw, and then there's a crack in the butt pad here to bust it off. So those are those are what we've got. Let me set these four aside. Needs a screw on the sight. Yeah, needs the elevation screw. And uh, $450, okay. And this one's in pretty good shape. It almost looks like somebody refinished the stock. And maybe when they did, they added the... Uh, butt pad to it. And they did a nice job. It's all pretty clean. Okay, the way these work is you need a source of CO2. And here I've got a 20 ounce bottle. I got this from Maquin Air Gun Shop. And the, it's threaded here on the end. And those threads match uh, the threads here. And so you'd set it up, you'd screw this into the uh, gun. Uh, hit the uh, valve and, and fill the, the uh, tube. And there's a check valve in here, so when you are done and you stop and unscrew it, uh, the gas doesn't ex escape. So that's kind of how that works. On the firing end, it's a simple mechanism. You cock it, put the pellet in, uh, and then you're ready to fire. Well, this is a relative of those last bunch of guns, the uh, 114s. This is a Crossman 118, and uh, it's a repeater. Otherwise, it would be the same as, uh, as those other ones. You know, with the uh, bulk fill mechanism here on the end, you'd fill a tube with uh, CO2. But um, the difference is, of course, that it's got a magazine here. Let's see. And uh, we'll take a look at this in a second. Um, but with the magazine in there, you cock it. And on the return stroke, it seats the pellet in the barrel, and you're ready to fire. Uh, so it's, it's got that uh, repeating mechanism, which is a little bit interesting and different than the one that they used on the uh, uh, 102. So let's take a look at the magazine and the mechanism real quick. Okay, well here's the magazine and it's kind of the forerunner, I guess, of what you would see uh, in later versions. This one, the, uh, I can get it in there. Um, well, this has to be a certain uh, height, other, otherwise it won't fit into the gun. And basically it just, you can see it pushes the pellet out the end little plunger there. Maybe it doesn't matter how it goes in, but it'll go in something like that and then as you cock the gun, put it up like this. As you cock the gun, you can see that the uh, this moves into position and then on the forward stroke puts the pellet into the barrel and then it's ready to fire. The other thing about this is it did have um, variable power here, so you could increase or decrease the hammer strike against the valve and adjust the power using that uh, knob right here. So this is kind of an interesting gun, and I'm, I'm curious um, as to whether it works or holds gas. Uh, so I may try to put some CO2 in it, there's no marking on it other than right here it says Crossman 22. And on this side, Crossman Arms, Rochester, New York. Otherwise, there's nothing that would, would tell us what it is. Uh, but looking at the Blue Book of Air Guns, um, I'm pretty confident. And Charlie also had it as a uh, Model 118. $725. Now, while we're looking at some of these older uh, Crossman guns, uh, this box had four of these uh, pneumatic, the multi-stroke pneumatic, the pumpers, the old Crossman pumpers, and here they are. I'm going to set this one aside. This is the uh, model 102, which has the uh, repeating mechanism, and uh, we'll take a look at that in a minute here. 
Let's see. $850. I would be very happy to get $850 for that. Um, but here are the uh, three that um, came in the collection. They're virtually identical, so I can't actually date them. Uh, they didn't have stereo numbers back then, but in terms of features, they all have the same caulking knob. Uh, they all have the same bolt. Um, this one lacks a sight, but otherwise it's uh, the same as these two. Um, I think, although I'm not certain, that this was the clickless version or what they called the clickless version because it has a synthetic forestock here as opposed to the wood. And what that means is, you know, as you're pumping up, you'd have the click, click, click. And this was clickless, I think. And so it's maybe a little quieter or conceivably they had some sort of felt or something in there. I don't know, but this is a synthetic uh, four stock and this isn't. Um, this one here, of course, lacks the wood altogether or the synthetic. And this one has been, looks to me, rebuilt. Uh, I don't know if it works. Let's see. And these you had to caulk them first. I don't think so because you can kind of hear the hear the air coming out the barrel. So this doesn't work, but it has been rebuilt and refinished here. Um, I'm going to show real quickly in the front. Uh, there's a these roll pins here go through the to hold the caulking linkage in there, and there's usually a cover for that, and that's missing on this one. So I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, but in any event, there's three examples here. I think I've probably got uh, three that I had previously. Um, and they're kind of fun guns. And the thing about them, everybody who sees them, you, know, you tell them that these are uh, 70 years old or, or older, or you know, maybe a little bit uh, newer than that. But um, that's pretty impressive to most people. Uh, they don't realize that we had these air guns, um, you know, as far back as the 1920s in these styles. So that's our uh, Crossman 101s. Okay, this is the 102, which is the uh, repeater. It does have a different uh, caulking knob here, if you notice. And sometimes you can date uh, or identify a particular version of the 101s and 102s by the caulking knobs. Um, that would be one thing you might look for. Um, and the way this works is you have a pellet loading port here in this tube. And then when the pellets are inserted, you just close it up so they don't fall back out. And it's got a cam in here so that as you, as you caulk it, you can see there's things happening. Essentially, you would hold this up so that the pellet drops back into this shuttle. And as you close it, it puts the pellet in line with the barrel. And so that's kind of how the mechanism on this one works, as opposed to the uh, 118 that we just looked at. These last two air guns in box number three um, are Apache air rifles or uh, Simcoe. These were made in the late 1940s, uh, and the company was only in business for a couple of years, but you find these from time to time. Uh, I've got a couple other ones that I had previously, and then these two came with the collection, so I've probably got four or five of these now. And true to the Apache reputation, um, none of them work. They don't hold air, they don't, I mean, the firing mechanism works, but um, that was kind of the reputation that Apache's uh, had, or Simcoe's had, is that uh, the value of, of one of these guns uh, is the same whether it's working or not, because if it works, um, it won't be for long. Uh, this is one that looks like somebody's tried to refinish, and it turned out pretty well on the uh, receiver and the the metal parts. I don't think they did anything on the wood yet. But the way these work 
This one's a little different because it's a repeater. This is the, uh, I don't know if it's the Fireball or, or what it is. Um, Fireball Texan. I mean, there's not any markings on this gun at all, so it's hard to say uh, what model they intended it to be. But I'm going to pull in here and we'll take a look a little bit in a second at the uh, uh, repeater, uh, the magazine. And these are pretty straightforward. Pull back, that's your uh, uh, bolt, and then this is the hammer spring there. So that's how they work. Let's take a look at that repeating mechanism. Okay, th this is the first one I've uh, been this intimate with, but um, this uh, magazine here is spring-fed, and it has a hole in the top, and this took those, uh, what were they, 247 or uh, number four buckshot or something like that, and you would load uh, and then release the... Uh, spring here and I think when you uh, cocked it or when you pulled this back uh, you might have to shake it or turn it or something like that but one of those balls would be fed into the barrel and then you could uh, close that up cock it and fire it um, and so this is a kind of an interesting gun and these two Apaches uh, are a good find I'm, I'm uh, interested in them and I think I'll go through what other ones I have and uh, take a look at those and see what kind of common elements. Uh, I mean, one interesting thing about some of these guns, not this one, this is uh, this just took the uh, the round lead balls but some of these had a well let me let me go grab one of my other ones we'll take a quick look at it. Okay, This is the uh, front end of an Apache. I've actually got it apart um, in kind of bad shape, you can see, but it, what they did is they had uh, barrel liners, so you could shoot one caliber um, and then like a 177 or whatever it was, and then if you wanted to shoot another caliber, you just pull that tube out and you've got yourself that uh, number four buckshot caliber. And then if you wanted to switch back, Put the liner back in and screw it back in. You're ready to go. So people uh, look at uh, dual caliber as being a new idea, but this is something came out of the 1940s. It's probably not a good idea because they went out of business and nobody picked up on the concept. So it, it's, uh, it may have been innovative, but not all innovation is uh, you know, desirable. So that is box three. Uh, we're moving right along. We'll get box four going here pretty quick and uh, wrap this up.